Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Baking Boss Kitchen Secrets. I'm your host, Naomi, and I am so excited to have another special guest on today. And today I've got someone who you'll find really super useful if you've got a cafe, a bakery or even a home baking business, because she is the person that knows everything you need to know about environmental health and how to make sure you get those five star ratings in your business. So welcome the safety expert Natalie how are you doing today? Hi Naomi very well thank you and thank you for thank you for having me. No problem so environmental health it is so so important in businesses and I'm someone who if anyone reads my emails or follows me on social you know I'm, I'm a bit of a clean freak I like everything very very clean and so when I opened my cafe and bar getting a five star rating was what I really focused on and But that said, I was absolutely terrified of an environmental health officer. So how did you get into sort of helping other businesses and other food businesses with their health and safety and all things that makes them operate to that five star standard? Yeah, so I um, ever since I was a kid, it's really like really strange, but like I knew that I wanted to be an environmental health officer. I didn't know the job title then, but I'd seen programs on TV like um, Life of Grime um, with Mr. Trebus. It was an environmental health officer who would have been in the housing department um, dealing with that scenario. Uh, And then other programs like similar to food inspectors where the officer will be going around filthy kitchens. As a kid, I literally loved um, programs like that. Um, I was just really fascinated and inspired by how you could see the officers working with the people, dealing with different challenges and things. Um, So, yeah, I um, I then went on to, um, I did an MSc in Environmental Health at University of Birmingham and then went on to qualify as an Environmental Health Officer in 2011 and um, worked for various local authorities for roughly 11 years. So a mix of district councils and London boroughs. Um, So I would actually be one of the people going out, doing the food hygiene inspections, issuing the food hygiene ratings. And then in 2022, I decided to leave my career in local government and start my own business. So now I'm really focused on um, helping small food businesses really um, with food safety because I know it can be really daunting um, so when I say I help small businesses businesses with food safety I don't do a huge amount of one-to-one consultancy um, but I created a video-based level two food hygiene course because I'm all about people actually learning something when they do the training so that they can they know what they need to do and they you know staff can work safely in practice um, so yeah, I'm very passionate about people actually understanding what they need to do um, when it comes to food safety and also just removing some of those unknowns around the food hygiene inspection as well. Because I think that can almost be the most daunting part. It's just not knowing what to expect. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was what was terrifying for me. And I think people want to do really well. They want to have like the best business they possibly have because most people that go into the small businesses particularly are really passionate about what they do and they don't want to make those mistakes so I remember that feeling and I know other business owners that have been through similar things even like in in their own home you know being in their own home with their home bakers too what do you think would be if if someone was just starting up a business so what is actually the process you would have to go through if you were about to open the doors of a cafe or a bakery how how would you go about all of this yeah so if you want to if you're planning to open a food business then by law you need to register as a food business with your local authority um technically you're meant to do this 28 days before at least 28 days before you plan to start trading um, so if you haven't opened your business yet, then I would say make sure you register with plenty of time. If you have already started trading and you're not registered, don't panic. Just register straight away. So the easiest way to do this is online um, on the .gov website. I would just Google food business registration. Pretty much the first um, website that comes up will be to the .gov website. You can register on there. Alternatively, go to your local council's website 
um, or probably the easiest way is to Google your local council's name and then food business registration, rather than trying to search on the council's website and that should take you through to a page on there. For most councils, you can either register on their website or download a form, which you can then fill out and email to them or post. But I would say registering online is gonna be the easiest, um, easiest way. Uh, registration is completely free and also it can't be refused. And then if anyone is wondering, well, from when I'm registered, how long do I then, like, can I start trading straight away? Yes, from when you're registered, you can start trading straight away. You don't need to wait um, for your food hygiene inspection. That's really great. And then obviously then it's the next bit is the training. So understanding exactly what food hygiene is. So that would be where I'm assuming people would could come to someone like you to find out more. So what so do people need qualification? What is the process then? Yeah, so it's, it's recommended then food handlers are trained to at least um, level two um, in food safety for catering businesses would be level two in food safety for catering. Um, managers or supervisors may want to be trained to a higher level. Um, but my in my experience in a lot of small businesses, most staff are trained to level two in food safety. Um, also, another key thing to think about is paperwork. Um, so making sure that you have a documented food safety management system in place. This is really, really key. Uh, one for staff training, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But also, um, if you want to have a chance of getting the highest rating, so a food hygiene rating of five, Having um, the paperwork in place um, is a really key part of that. So in terms of this paperwork, then the Food Standards Agency has produced the Safer Food Best Business Pack, which, you, uh, which you're probably um, aware of. So this is completely free um, to download from their website. Uh, website is food.gov.uk forward slash SFBB. Um, for most small catering businesses, this pack um, will be suitable, but it's just a case of going through, filling each of the parts in to make it relevant to your business. And then I would say you can also use elements of this pack to train your staff, because one of the things that the officer is going to be looking at during your inspection is, one, do you have a food safety management system in place? Two, like, is it, let's say you're using Safer Food Better Business, is it filled in? And then three, is it actually like what you're doing in your business? Is it reflecting what you've said you're doing in the in your food safety system? And essentially, if the staff don't understand the parts of this pack or this system that are relevant to their job role, they're not they're probably not going to be doing in practice what they need to do. Um, so in that pack, in the SFBB pack, there is towards the end a staff training like record section where you could actually go through the relevant sections of the pack with each of your staff members. So you don't need to go through the whole pack with them, but pick the bits that are relevant to the job role you're gonna get them to do. So for example, personal hygiene is probably gonna be relevant to everyone. So I would go through that section probably with all of your team members. And um, maybe the cooking section would only be relevant to say back of house staff, for example. Um, but then, yeah, train the staff in the parts of the pack that are relevant to them and then complete the training record at the back. Yeah, that that's really helpful. I, I think one of the things that I certainly experienced and I'm sure like you were saying, getting useful learnings from when you do your level twos or your level threes is really essential. Whenever I did the training and my staff did the training and we were all level two and level three because and we did it a couple of times throughout the time I had the cafe because it's good to refresh yourself. We found there was an awful lot of jargon and some of my staff were like, they, they've they been doing it for years and they were very, very good at their safety and they'd done all the paperwork and everything like that. But the actual, <laughs> when it came to actually doing the actual course itself, it was, they, they were saying, I don't know if I understand some of this and it was really difficult. So I'm guessing that's why you've created the courses you've had. So it's actually practical learning that people can understand. Yeah, exactly. Um, over the years, obviously, working for local authorities, I've, I've been to businesses where they can show a food hygiene certificate, but staff still don't understand um, mm. food safety in practice necessarily. So, you know, things like cross contamination, you could see a, a could be shown a certificate for a food handler, but then you witness that food handler put raw meat 
into the fridge on the top shelf next to salad items, for example. So instantly you're thinking, how effective has this training been? So this is why I've uh, the training course I created, um, it's entirely video based. Uh, so they're pre-recorded videos so people can do the course in their own time. Um, but they're video based, they're taught by me as an environmental health officer. So I can share a bit more sort of real life experiences and my knowledge um, throughout the course and also give practical examples. So for example, in the course, I actually physically show how to check the fridge temperature and in a commercial kitchen, rather than say just someone having to read words on a screen that, that talks you through how to do it. Um, so yeah, I've just tried to make things much more visual and as you say, much more sort of practical real life examples as well. That That's so unbelievably helpful because sometimes it's just, it is just words on a page and when you're trying to translate it into your own business, it can be very difficult. So you've probably seen quite a lot of different businesses over the years and kind of that's really helped inform you what people really need the help with in terms of training and hygiene and that sort of thing. What do you think are some of the biggest things that businesses miss unknowingly? Because if you don't know, you don't know, right? Yeah, so unknowingly, I think the key one would be um, businesses, especially new businesses, not knowing that they need a documented food safety management system. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to do the inspection. The business just doesn't have anything in the way of food safety paperwork. And even if the, the premises is, is spotlessly clean and they've got other things in place, without having that paperwork, they're really going to struggle to get more than a one out of five. Um, so I think probably for new businesses, not knowing that they need to have this documented food safety management system is probably the main one. Um, and then other things are things like sanitizer complying with the relevant British standard. So um, this is something that the officer is probably going to be checking. So your sanitizer or your antibacterial spray that you're using in your business to sanitize food preparation surfaces and equipment needs to comply with a certain British standard. It needs to either comply with BSEN 1276 or BSEN 13697. This is something the officer is probably going to be checking so you can normally find this information on the product label if you just turn around to the back of the bottle. You'll normally see it there, often in quite small writing. Um, but I would say if you can't see it on the bottle um, and you're not sure, I would I would reach out to your supplier or the manufacturer and, and just check with them. Yeah, absolutely. And they were two things that when we had our inspections, environmental health officer did check was did the check. paperwork. Yeah, absolutely. And the um, sanitizer, that was one thing they did. That, so it that definitely was one. And one we weren't necessarily aware of at the time. So it's a really good tip for people. The other I might just come... mention, oh, I was going to mention on that no, point no. in case people are thinking, oh, are these ones really expensive? Where can we get them? The ones that comply aren't necessarily any more expensive than the others. So for example, some of the supermarket own brand ones, I think the Tesco's one and the Waitrose own brand antibacterial spray um, comply. And also I think there's one called Astonish um, antibacterial surface cleaner, which someone told me the other day you can get in Poundland. That one complies as well. So it's not like you've got to spend a fortune to get one that is compliant. No, absolutely. It doesn't have to cost the earth and it doesn't have to necessarily be a special supplier you get them from, which is really useful. One of the when I opened my business and it was a few years ago, I was maybe a little bit more naive because I thought I was going to be doing freshly made cakes, all of these sorts of things. I didn't really consider the dietary requirements that people did have. And I knew about all the allergens, but we soon very quickly learned that a lot of our customers required cakes that were made about gluten, which obviously if you've got um you may correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't say gluten free if you've got gluten in your kitchen. You have to say made without gluten or similar um, or vegan. So we were very, very much aware that our customers required that. So we had a process in place for this. But for people that are kind of coming into this new that are thinking, what if I get questions about gluten free or celiac or the allergens? How do I manage those in a kitchen when I've got ingredients that don't necessarily line up with that? 
Yeah, so I think in terms of um, managing um, allergens, first of all, there's a couple of things that the law requires at the moment. So one, you need to signpost your customers um, to ask about food allergies and intolerances. So for example, in the shop, cafe, et cetera, just having a sign up or a statement on the menu saying, please ask about um, allergies and intolerances. That's one thing you need to do. And then if a customer does ask, you need to make sure that one staff understand the process in your business for managing any allergen requests. So we don't want anyone guessing, oh, no, I, I think, yeah, I think you'll be okay with this. We don't want people guessing. Clear procedure. So this comes back to staff training as well. Mm -hmm. And then it may even be a case of having one key person in the business who deals with allergen requests from customers and then making sure accurate information is provided to that customer. So some businesses may use like an allergen matrix that lists all of their um, dishes or products. And then, uh, and you can download this from the Food Standards Agency website, just Google FSA uh, allergen matrix. The 14 allergens are listed along the top. And then you would just go through and, and tick um, what allergens are contained within each of your products. Now, I suppose if a business isn't confident that they can guarantee that they can safely produce a dish or a product that's free of a particular allergen, they need to be making their customer aware of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as, as, you, as you've explained, you can say to the customer, we could make this product without, say, gluten, sorry, with gluten-free flour, um, but it's prepared in a kitchen where we use um, other flour, et cetera. So we we cannot guarantee that this product is free from, from this particular allergen. I think people need to be making their customers like definitely aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. And we, I definitely had customers that came in. I had actually someone who had a laminated card with all their allergens. And I had to say to them, I'm, I'm really not comfortable serving you in here because it was literally a whole card of things that, the customer was unable to eat and I I cannot I really just don't want to serve you because I'm so concerned about all your allergens that I just feel that I'm not going to be able to satisfy your needs in the right way and I'm really sorry about that but there was it was quite a long list of different ones and I had quite unusual allergen requests over the time as well which I'd often have conversations with a customer beforehand particularly if it was like a pre-order like an afternoon tea I think one of the trickiest ones I had was citric acid allergen which is quite it gets in everything citric acid you'll be quite surprised but I spent a lot of time going through everything and I actually spoke to the customer directly about it to say this is what I can do but this is my limits of what I can do so if you're happy with that then I'll serve you but if you're not then I can't necessarily serve you what you want and often that was definitely the way to manage the customer expectations when it came to allergens. So I think if you're someone listening and you're worrying about the allergens, it's all possible, but it is getting that system correct, having confidence that you know what you're doing. And if your staff aren't confident, get them to ask someone who is. I think that's really important. Um, and yeah. I think one top tip I had was, and certainly one that I see a lot more now when I'm a customer is that I had, when people took the orders, there was a button on my till that said dietary requirements so people could actually ask. And even now that in a lot of places, if an I order, for those whoever want to buy me a coffee out there, I have an oat milk flat white. So if you're meeting me for a coffee, that's what I'll drink. But actually some places ask whether it's actually an allergen, an intolerance or preference. So that's actually a really good way of them knowing exactly what the customer is which I think gives you as a business owner a little bit more confidence in what you're serving your customers is right for their dietary needs yeah a hundred percent and I think also just to, I think I kind of mentioned but other key, key points just making sure any information provided to the customer is accurate yeah. and, and bearing in mind if, with some um, pre-packed products ingredients are changing constantly so just because a supplier has previously delivered you this product and it doesn't contain that particular allergen the supplier could have changed some of their ingredients so making sure you're really regularly checking ingredients labels on pre-packed products as well um, is really really important um yeah yeah uh, 
and I think some of the some of the products that like baking powder sometimes has gluten in it so watch out for that one that was one of the things that we spent a lot of time going through and things like um sausages or anything like that they often have wheat in it but we work with a local butcher and actually we just got all ours gluten-free because it just saved a lot of hassle from our end when we were serving customers that we knew that all our sausages were the same when they were just took one left step out of the talk thinking about it in terms of sort of the best way to approach your sort of environmental health officer if they're coming into your business and again it can be quite terrifying particularly if you've got a home business I've always found that actually they're all very friendly they're all very helpful and actually they want you to do well so they're there to have questions asked aren't they they want they want you to ask the questions in fact isn't that's certainly been my experience yeah um definitely so EHOs want to help um I know sometimes it can feel like they're there trying to catch you out um there could be maybe the odd EHO out there who is but like honestly in my experience like EHOs they're there to help they want you to do well. Their priority is making sure that the food that you're producing and serving to your customers is, is safe. They're, they're there to protect the public. So if they can work with you and you're willing to work with them and you're going to listen and take on board advice, um, then the inspection is going to go a lot more smoothly. Sometimes I suppose there can be issues if a business is very resistant to sort of listening and taking on board advice. Um, then the inspection probably isn't going to go as smoothly. But I think, yeah, any questions you have, I think if you can obviously show that you've thought things through, that you're trying, um, don't just wait for the officer to turn up and think, oh, they're just going to tell me everything I need to do. You need to take some action yourself, do the research, be fairly clear, this is how I'm going to do things. Um, but then, yeah, ask them questions during the inspection. I'm planning to do things this way or this is how I'm doing it. Is this OK or do you, is, do you have a suggestion of a better way to do it? So, for example, um, home baking businesses, uh, a question I get asked a lot is about wash hand basins, mm. um, especially, for example, if a business has um, a home baking business has just a single sink in their kitchen. What are their options? And there are a few different options. Um, and what I say to um, businesses is think through these options. Think about which one may work for you in your scenario. And then when the officer comes, you can say to them, well, I've thought it through. This is what I'm planning to do. This is what I'm doing. Are you happy with this? Or actually, would you prefer me to do it a different way? Um, rather than them turning up and asking, well, how do you wash your hands? And you've just got a single sink and you say, well, I just use this for everything. And you haven't really thought it through because actually you could be cleaning and disinfecting that single sink between uses. So between hand washing and bef um, before you wash any equipment, or you could set up like a hand wash um, station with a bowl of warm water, some soaps and paper towels. And um, there's, there's different options to just show that you've, you've thought it through um before you I'd say before you ask um the question yeah and a lot a lot of it is fairly logical in terms of just and it's just again showing that you're actually making the effort to think through how to do these things and getting it right another one that I think a lot of people are worried about is pets so definitely in a home business I was a pet friendly cafe um, when I say pet, it was mostly a dog. We didn't usually get many others. Although I know my my niece, who actually used to work at a coffee shop, did get get some bringing a cat once. Very unusual, but oh. you know, I'm not, I'm not I'm not here to judge. If you want to take your cat, I'm sure they wouldn't mind. But um, how do you manage pets in businesses? What's the sort of rules around that? Because I know some owners do have pets, like I did, and I was very open about being dog friendly. But we had quite strict guidelines in place for for my staff as well so we had processes in place that were actually managed so what would be your recommendations if you've got a home business or even a a, a place where you want to have dogs and allowed in it yeah um so home-based businesses this is a question i get asked a lot um can i have pets if i run a food business from home yes you can you just need to manage things so when you're preparing food for your business make sure that your pets are out of the kitchen and that you clean and disinfect 
food preparation services and equipment before you start preparing food for your business. Um, yeah, just essentially manage it and explain this to the officer during your inspection. I would also say during your inspection, don't have the pets wandering around the kitchen because if you're saying, well, this is this is how I manage it, but at the time of your inspection, the cat or dog is wandering around the kitchen, it's it's not necessarily believable. So I would almost have it things set up as to how you're actually pl planning to operate um, when you have your inspection. For other businesses, cafes, etc., cetera, um, I, I have two dogs that I love. I love dogs, so I'm always on the lookout for pet-friendly restaurants, cafes, etc. cetera. Um, it's just a case of the business managing it so um, you wouldn't have the animals um, wandering around the kitchen. Um, and if staff members are going to be, say, stroking um, any pets that come in, they need to wash their hands thoroughly before they do any other tasks, before they handle food, et cetera. Yeah. And actually, one of the things we were particularly good at were, I mean, we were, we often knew the dog's names more than the owners sometimes. <laughs> um, but my staff are very, very obvious, particularly for the benefit of their own sales and the customers and other staff of actually going, we are going to go and wash our hands. So they would usually say it once they'd given their dog a treat or something, they'd actually make it very obvious that is exactly what they'd gone in to do. And we'd have a very dedicated sink in the kitchen. In terms of staff training or if you have a home business, what are your sort of best tips for people? What's the best way to kind of go about it? In terms of training and getting yeah, ready for training. the inspection? Training. Yeah. Okay. So um, for home-based businesses, I would say, first of all, probably use the Safer Food Better Business Pack as your food safety management system. I appreciate when you look through the pack, it's going to look quite big and you're probably going to be thinking, not all of this is relevant to me. I'm, I'm making cakes at home. This isn't all relevant. Go through it, fill out the parts that are relevant to your business. If there's any bits that aren't, just I'd just say just pop not applicable in the box or at the top of the page. Um, simply going through this pack is actually going to really help you understand things anyway. So that's going to help with the training. And then um, I would recommend um, doing a level two um, food safety course to get your certificate. Doesn't have to be my course. There's, there's plenty of level two um, courses out there. So I would just pick the one that's, that's best for you. Um, check through the syllabus, just make sure it is comprehensive and it, it covers um, the key things, food safety. Um, some courses, cover a bit more than others so just just do a bit of research on that as well um also probably worth me mentioning the food standards agency does actually offer a free online um allergy training course um so uh, the easiest way to find it i would just google fsa um free online allergy training and you don't have to do this, but it looks good during your inspection as well. You get a certificate at the end, which you can download and print off. So, um, so yeah, and it's free. Yeah, absolutely. And the more information you have, the better you are set up right. Natalie, if people want to come and learn food safety with you, do the level two, where do they go? Yeah, so my website is www.thesafetyexpert.co.uk. Um, so you can find all the details of the course on there. Also, I'm pretty active on Instagram um, with food, providing food safety tips, et cetera, every week. So if if people would find that helpful, then my Instagram is the underscore safety underscore expert. Fabulous. Well, thank you ever so much. It's been really informative and I'm sure people listening in have found this really, really helpful into demystifying the mystique of the environmental health world and hopefully it will make their lives a little bit easier when it comes to running their own businesses thank you so much for having me it's been great speaking with you fabulous well i'll be back again next week with another fabulous episode of baking boss kitchen secrets until then everybody have a great week and happy baking <laughs>